Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to the Holder Hack channel. This week we're going to be going over my maximum DPS guide for Blackwing Lair, the long-awaited maximum DPS guide for Blackwing Lair. We've cleared the place, you know, three or four times now, so I feel pretty comfortable in telling people how to do it. Gotten 99s or 100s on most of the bosses, and I'm going to do everything I possibly can to help you too join the Pink Parse Gang. Hashtag. Just like in my Molten Core guide, we're going to go over world buffs, potions, situational buffs, how to position yourself, and little tips and tricks on every single boss so you can get the most possible damage you'd ever do. Let's do it. And I would just like to say, of course, this video benefits greatly from having already watched my single target DPS rotation video guide and my AOE target DPS rotation guide, both of which I'm going to be mentioning in the boss fights for what you should be doing as your rotation. So I'm not just constantly repeating the same thing over and over again. Check those out here somewhere. Another thing to note is that this guide is a complementary guide to already understanding the basic mechanics of these boss fights. I'm going to go over the mechanics that really affect you, but it's very useful to know and watch other guides that are going to go over the actual, like, this is everything they do point by point. I'm not going to tell you all that. I'm just going to tell you how to pad the meters as much as possible. So just like in the Molten Core Guide, we're going to go over the fact that to maximize your damage as any spec, as any class, in any raid, you're going to need world buffs. You have to stack all of these world buffs and try not to die for as long as possible in the raid. World buffs include the Anixia Head or Nefarian buff, uh, the Rend buff if you're Horde. If you're not Horde, you made the wrong decision. You get the Dire Maul Tribute buffs, get all three of them. You get the Songflower Serenade buff from Felwood, and then if the Dark Moon Fair is up, you go and get the Sage's Dark Moon uh, Fortune world buff, which gives you flat 10% increase to damage. That buff is insane, and if you can get it, you absolutely should get it pretty much over any of the other ones. Literally flat 10% damage is crazy. Now, barring world buffs, you have your consumables. These consumables are the bare minimum of what you need to be using in every raid. Can you beat these raids without world buffs and consumes? Absolutely. Should you come to the raid with absolutely no consumes and no world buffs? Absolutely not. Now, since I'm making this guide for Shaman, we have to use every single consumable in the game, so this is going to cover all the magic consumables, and all the physical consumables because we have to use all of them. So your baseline consumables are going to be Elixir of the Mongoose, Elixir of Giants. The Elixir of Giants can be replaced with a Juju Power, right? And then you have your Winterfall Firewater, which can be replaced with a Juju Might. You get the Jujus by farming the Eco up in Winter Spring. I'll have guides for all of this down below, but you can replace Firewater and giants with two different kinds of juju which you get from a quest up in winter spring and it's far more cost effective to do it this way for your magic boosting potions you would use a greater arcane elixir or just a regular arcane elixir if you wanted to save some money on top of an elixir of frost power now this is to truly maximize your magical dps and is a little bit of overkill for most people if you're running an elemental flurry build or perhaps elemental devastation it makes a little bit more sense to use these buffs but otherwise, since we can't really twist Magma Totem into Fire Nova Totem into Searing Totem like we could in Molten Core, which is kind of funny, since most of the mobs in Molten Core, the, you know, Fire Elemental Raid, aren't immune to fire, but a lot of the mobs in Blackwing Lair are, we just kind of have to rely on Frost Shock. But if you truly want to maximize your magical damage and you want to maximize your Frost Shock damage, you're going to have to stack these magical buffs. You can also have a free action potion stack in your inventory to help with some of the Draconids who war stomp. Uh, when they war stomp, you're stunned for like five seconds. So obviously popping a fat before that fight is super useful. So you can, you know, still hit the thing and not just stand there being useless. Also, you're going to want to go to the Blasted Lands and get your Blasted Lands buffs. 
Depending on what you're trying to go for, you can get a crit buff, you can get a strength buff, you can get yet another stam buff, but I recommend you get roids so you can buff your strength and do the most damage. Moving on to food buffs, your best in slot is going to be the blessed sun fruit you can get from Argent Dawn rep. You can also use grilled squid for plus agility or various stam buffs. There's millions of different kinds of food that just gives you stamina and not millions, but there's quite a few. So you could pick from any of those, but if you want to do the most damage, especially as a shaman, you're going to pick the strength. Final food buff that's nice to have, especially on some of the trash mobs in this instance, is Dragon's Breath Chili. Some of these mobs become vulnerable to fire, so you'll end up doing massive amounts of damage with this thing, as well as having it on like Chromagus if he's vulnerable to fire. It could proc and really, really up your damage on that boss. So it's something that I don't personally do because it's like one of those like extra, extra, extra moves. But if you have a couple stacks of Dragon's Breath Chili in your bank and you want to bring one of them with the fight, it'll actually be a pretty good move and you should try to do that. One of the main potions you always have to have in your inventory, especially when you're trying to do melee DPS, is going to be the Limited Invulnerability Potion. The second you pull aggro on a lot of these mobs, you will instantly die. So you have to have that thing bound to a hotkey that you are ready to press at any moment. So limited invulnerability potions are super important. Make sure you have at least 10 of them. Then your situational potions are going to be a greater fire protection potion, regular fire protection potions, and possibly shadow protection potions. The fire protection potions can help you in the suppression room, they can also help you on Broodlord, they can also help you on Fire Maw, so they're just generally useful for a good deal of Blackwing Lair. The shadow protection potion is very good if you get targeted by Nefarian in the first phase of his fight. Otherwise, it's not really all that useful, but it's nice to have one or two in your inventory. Then finally, you're going to have your longevity items like health potions, mana potions, demonic end or dark runes, whipper root tubers, and or night dragon's breaths. I know for certain that the night dragon's breaths share a cooldown with demonic runes since they're both secondary items that restore mana. The Whipper Root Tubers, however, do not share a cooldown with health potions, and I am pretty sure they also do not share a cooldown with Demonic Runes, but I haven't tested that as of yet, so feel free to try that out on your own. But you should definitely have Whipper Root Tubers, health potions, mana potions, and Dark or Demonic Runes to make sure you can stay in the fight for as long as possible. Okay, now that I have all the world buffs, potions, other buffs, situational use things covered, uh, we can actually get into the boss fights, which is the fun part. I'm sure I've had these things listed directly next to my head so you can read it in case I missed anything. I'm sure I'll be adding in something because when I initially record these videos, I usually go back and triple check myself. And so I will of course be adding every possible thing that exists for you to use right here now that is done let's go into the boss fights the actual fun part the first fight we're going to talk about is the first fight that happens razor gore the untamed is the first boss in blackwing lair he's not hard as a boss there's a little bit of an encounter before him though as i'm sure you know whether you're doing the four corner strategy or everyone's just clumped up in the middle killing all the ads as they come out i truly hope you're not having to kite anything because this isn't vanilla Make sure you target the mages first, as you can kill them very quickly as melee. Otherwise, just focus on anything that comes out of your corner or comes near you, and try not to pull aggro, because these things can hit you very, very hard, and you will die if you are hit by things. Razor Gore as a fight, very easy. The only thing you have to worry about mechanically is if your tanks get conflagged, which the boss can do, he can conflag all of them at once. Make sure you pop your limited invulnerability potion. Otherwise, do your single target DPS rotation, maximize your uptime on your totems, and this thing's gonna die very fast and you're gonna have a very good parse because there's no reason you shouldn't be fully buffed with world buffs at this point. Veilstress the Corrupt is another tank and spank fight from the viewpoint of DPS. 
What you can do as a shaman to maximize your DPS on Vale is just spam Lightning Shield as much as possible, as every time his Fire Pulse AoE goes out, he will be taking your Lightning Shield damage, and mana is free on this fight, so feel free to Totem Twist at will anything you want. You can get Grace of Air, Wind Fury, Tranquil Air if you're worried about pulling aggro. This is a threat fight more than anything else. Do not pull threat on the tank or Veil will breathe on the raid and kill everyone and it will make people very, very grumpy at you. Otherwise, and other than totem twisting and lightning shield spamming, just maintain your single target DPS rotation and like I said, he's gonna die real quick. Briefly, I wanna go over the suppression room and the trash leading up to the suppression room. Uh, these drakes in particular, if you pull aggro on them, they will one-shot you, as has happened to me before. My personal take on this fight is I don't even care. On these drakes, I use a one-hander and a shield. I wait for five sunders. Like, I'm not going to chance it at all, especially considering if you didn't die on Veil, vale, if you didn't get Burning Adrenaline, and you still have your world buffs, this is when it's just, like, really stupid to lose them. So, this trash in particular, I play it a little bit safe. But otherwise, use your regular totems. They are susceptible to fire damage. You can hit them with fire, nova, searing. Just one-hander and a shield until you get the suppression room, and then it's fine. Once you get to the suppression room, minimal totems. You can use fire resistance totems sometimes if your raid's about to be flame struck. Otherwise, try not to drop too many totems because the whelps respawning will tag them all and they'll come back to your group and it won't be fun for anybody. Single target down the hatchers, the, the orcs, uh, first, and then you can worry about AoEing the little whelps as you move on to Broodlord. There's a couple things to consider with Broodlord, and a lot of it comes down to the pull. You really want to try to make sure the pull on Broodlord is as non-scuffed as possible. So when the tanks pull, there's not a lot of whelps up, the suppressors are down, that way you guys can engage and actually start DPSing. When Broodlord does his Blast Wave, it is a threat-lowering mechanic, much in the same way that Anixia does that. So you never really want to be above about 75% threat on your threat meter. If you're above 75% threat, he could do a Blast Wave, and then you become the tank, and you'll become the tank for about mm, one second, because he's going to hit you for 8k, and you're going to die. The Blast Wave can be resisted with a lot of fire resistance gear. That's what I personally do. I don't LOS it or avoid it. It doesn't really matter. Fire resistance totem, uh, full black dragon scale, a couple fire resistance pieces, and you're going to resist most of those Blast Waves. The tank might be able to wear a couple pieces of FR, but make sure that if you're resisting Blast Waves and the tank is not resisting Blast Waves, that you do not become the tank. Because, like I said, you will become the tank for one second and then you will die and that is not the best way to do damage next little bit of trash talk coming up we got the goblins in the next room these goblins are pretty annoying and their bombs can kill you very quickly so typically you're going to want to los them until they're in the room and bunched up when they are in the room and bunched up throw some grenades at them use dense dynamite you're going to get really big damage from that Keep a Fire Nova over there, you'll get big damage from that. If they're still alive, try to get a Magma in there. You can really farm these guys for a decent chunk of DPS. You just have to make sure your Fire Resistance Totem is down. And if a couple of them are looking at you, it's not really the best time to run in because they're all going to throw bombs at you and you're going to die. Now we're going to move on to Fire Maw. Fire Maw is a special case where there's a way you can LOS his damage if you need to, but what I'm going to teach you how to do is not LOS his damage. So Fire Maw has this constant stacking debuff that hits you when you're in range of him that makes it to where you continually take more and more and more fire damage, and when it gets up really, really high and his AoE fire damage hits you, you're just going to instantly die and it's not going to be great for your life. So the key to fighting Fire Maw is just stacking as much fire resistance as possible. In my last Fire Maw attempt, I had 315 fire resistance. When you have that much fire resistance, his stacking debuff is resisted to the point to where it never stacks. In fact, I think the most I got up to was like two stacks of his fire debuff, and then it cleared itself off. So I was able to stay in the entire time and got a world one parse on Fire Maw. All you need on Fire Maw is fire resistance gear. Keep down your regular DPS totems, do your regular single target DPS rotation. If you cannot get up to 300 fire resistance or 250 fire resistance, you know, 
really high fire resistance, you can constantly LOS behind the pillar, but I'm telling you right now, you don't need to do that. What you need is fire resistance gear. If you don't have the fire resistance gear, you can always rely on a greater fire protection potion to eat some of that damage. But if you're in the whole time and the stacking debuff is up to like 10, as soon as that greater fire protection potion wears off, you're just going to die. So make sure that you are LOSing until you get enough fire resistance gear. But then, when you get that gear, this fight is a joke. I'm just going to put Evanrock and Flamegore in the same blurb here. They're fundamentally the same fight for the most part. The only difference is for Flamegore, you're going to want to have down your fire resistance totem since he does do a pulsing fire AoE when he's not being tranked. The only time though that's really going to happen is if your hunters aren't doing what they're supposed to do or if you don't have enough hunters. But keep the fire resistance totem down for Flamegore and then on Evanrock, he is going to be getting turned constantly, taunting from one tank to the other to the other, possibly to a third tank. So just make sure that you're always behind the boss. Otherwise, you're going to get Shadow Flamed, which is really not great. Or even worse than Shadow Flamed, you're going to get parried. And we don't want that. That lowers our damage. Next, we come up to one of the most mechanic-intensive heavy fights in all of Blackwing Lair, and that's, of course, Chromagus. It's really only that way because the fight changes every week, but the only one you really, really have to worry about is Time Lapse. Otherwise, just make sure you don't get hit by his breaths. Some of them will kill you, some of them will make your DPS insignificant, but it all just comes down to running in and out of where you're supposed to be in the most efficient way possible. Right when he's about to do his breath, run out. Immediately after he casts his breath, run back in. Don't hang out in that alcove longer than you need to. Always keep your Searing Totem down that can fish for fire vulnerability. You have mods that will tell you what his vulnerability is, or you could just have the mages or warlocks or other people attacking the boss call out on Discord what the vulnerability is so you can pad with Frost Shock, Lightning Bolts, Flame Shock. I don't really recommend you do Earth Shock because probably pulling aggro on Chromagus is a bad idea, but if you're significantly lower on the threat table, you might be able to get in an Earth Shock or two, but I wouldn't rely on it. Make sure that if you get time lapse, you run in with everybody else and everybody but the off tank gets stunned. Otherwise, Chromagus is going to run around and kill everyone and it's going to be a very bad time. Of course, we're on to the last boss fight in Blackwing Lair now, the last loot pinata, Nefarian. I look back on how much my vanilla guild struggled on Nefarian, and I just, I weep. It's essentially the same fight as Anixia, with like two or three extra steps, and it's really not that big of a deal. Um, you know, there's a couple of fights in this, this instance where you really wanted to have your Anixia cloak equipped uh, if you got Shadow Flamed. Well, in the Farian's fight, you're absolutely going to be Shadow Flamed, so make sure that you have your Anixia Cloak equipped. And this is the one fight where having that greater Shadow Protection Potion is pretty useful, as in Phase 1, he randomly targets somebody and just decides that he's going to Shadow Bolt them to infinity. So if he targets you and you have that Shadow Protection Potion, it's going to help and help your healers get enough time to you know target over to you and keep you alive. Kill the Dragon in Phase 1. Move over to phase two after the Shadow Flame. This phase is essentially Anixia. Uh, there's going to be some fears. There's going to be class calls. Now, with the Shaman class call, it's awful for our DPS. It makes you completely run out of mana, and you have to really focus on killing the totems that you're dropping. Also, make sure that you're not dropping these totems in large groups of people, so you may want to move away from Nefarian and kill them in a corner with a couple other people, especially because the Fire Nova Totem going off in all of your healers is not going to be a great time for them. Barring the Shaman class call, the Warrior class call doesn't affect you, the Druid class call doesn't affect you, the Mage class call, you may end up sheeped, you will get dispelled, the Warlock class call, you're gonna have like two Warlocks in your whole raid, so there's gonna be like two Infernals. You can decide to kill those Infernals or just keep hitting Nefarian, really doesn't matter. And then the Priest class call, well, hopefully the Priests don't kill your main tank. That's really what you're gonna hope for. And since we're not Alliance, we don't gotta worry about the Paladin class call, which by all accounts is really annoying because he puts a bubble on Nefarian. Now, 
Other than your usual single target DPS rotation and the fact that Nefarian and Anixia and all the Drakes, of course, are immune to fire, you are going to worry about the 20% switch where all the mobs you killed in Phase 1 run out in Phase 3 of Nefarian. Now, this is where a grand majority of your damage in this fight is going to come from. You're going to use Dynamite or Sapper Charges or Stratholm Holy Water and your Fire Nova Totem to do as much damage as possible on as many of these undead Draconids as possible. When you hit them all with your Sapper and your Fire Nova, have a shield equipped because they will all target you and they will all kill you. When you look at your logs at the end of this fight, you will see, I mean, the last time I did it, it was like 30% of my damage was from just sappering the Draconids. I didn't even get to get a Fire Nova Totem off because I'm not expecting to improve Fire Nova Totem. But that's where the Elemental Devastation builds really come into their own in Blackwing Lair is, is really in that one part of that one fight. That quick cast Fire Nova Totem is just amazing. So that's it for Nefarian. You can Tremor Totem his uh, fear, you can LOS his fear, and then he dies and you enjoy your loot. So that concludes our maximum DPS guide for Blackwing Lair. I truly hope that this can help more and more and more of my shamans join the Pink Parse Gang at the 99th percentile. A lot of these fights in all of vanilla, it just really comes down to preparation and the fact that you've done it a couple of times. Once you get in the rhythm and you have your limited invulnerability potions, you have your faps, you have your fire protection potions, you have your fire resistance gear, you can cheese all of these fights and it'll be just an amazing experience where loot rains from the heavens and you continually get more and more and more powerful and prove all the haters wrong. If I missed anything, I'm sure I'm going to add it in some sort of addendum part at the end of the video, so make sure to keep watching to the end in case I have to add stuff on. Uh, otherwise, if you like the content, make sure to give me a sub, like, ring the bell. If you want to follow me on Twitch, that would make my heart grow ten times bigger. We're really close to hitting that partner status. I need 75 average views for every time I stream. I stream two or three times a week. So anytime I'm streaming, if you can just give me that view, I would love you forever. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day, week, month, year. You got any questions, comments, concerns, leave them below. Until next time, this is Holder. Bye-bye.